Welcome everybody, we're so glad you're here. We're going to talk about fan fiction, we're going to talk briefly, and then we're going to do some writing. So you should make sure you have some implement for writing, whether it's a computer or a notebook or what you have, because we're going to throw some prompts at you when I'm done and Dr. Aaron is done, and then we'll hear some of what people put together. So, so fan fiction, of course, could be as long as you want, it can also be as short as you want. So we'll be talking about flash fiction, we'll be doing, right? So. I want to talk about sort of the origins of fan fiction. Uh, so we're talking through Star Trek and Doctor Who, which is my specialty, uh, and the monkeys, which is another specialty of mine. And I'll explain what I'm talking about in a second, right? So Star Trek, stage one in fan fiction. This TV show showed up, and it, people became deeply dedicated to it, and the networks canceled it. How dare they do that? But they do that all the time, don't they? So now this audience of people had come to love the characters. And this is the key to any real fan fiction. You became involved and impassioned about these people, whoever they happen to be. And because you loved them so much, you couldn't let it go. You couldn't leave those stories behind. We are very, very creative people. Long before there was mass media and television and long before there were records, people made their own entertainment, right? With your family, you told a horror story, you did whatever it was. It was personal. So we've always had that talent. We kind of let it slide for a while. And then, of course, there's attitudes about, oh, that's a professional writer versus me. Well, anyone who tells a story that engages someone has done something that's entertaining and worthwhile. So these folks, of course, they didn't have the internet. Oh my god, there was a time before the internet, right? So what did they do? They created what were called fanzines. So you had to get mailing lists of other people who liked the show you wanted from around the country and around the world. How did you do that? That's a lot of work. That's a lot of getting uh, addresses, phone numbers. We didn't have easy free calling with our cell phones, so everybody's got to find a way to communicate. Eventually, different people around the country, they put together these fanzines. So I'm talking about very deeply dedicated fans, all beginning with Star Trek, which is a big deal. The fans then became such a movement, I have my own personal copy of what's in the box over there, Star Trek The New Voyages, they actually got their fan fiction published, which was unheard of back in the day, right? But the power of this fan group was so strong, and I've had this book literally since high school, it's got my maiden name in it, right? Mm -hmm. Now. That became so powerful that what are we going to do next? We're going to show the studio. Sorry, I hit the wrong thing. We're going to show the studio they should make a movie out of this TV show. And they did. That's the power of that fan fiction. It convinced them there was enough of an audience. They would come back to the theaters. But this particular first movie wasn't very good, we all knew. <laughs> so there had to be a few other things that happened along the way. It started a whole other TV show. Just the power of this group of fans as they grew and they grew and they grew, right? And outside of the TV show, I think it's hilarious. You may or may not have seen this movie. You really should if you haven't. Parody. The ultimate success to any story, any set of characters, is people love them so much. Galaxy Quest. People will make fun of them and enjoy it deeply. And this movie is far better than it needs to be because it was written by fans who truly loved the franchise and took that into consideration. So when you see this movie, you're like, I'm crying and I shouldn't cry in a parody. But it's so, the characters are so well drawn. All right, so it's a beautiful thing. So I must say. This is, well, the writers of this were some fans, right? It didn't start in fan fiction, but they themselves were such fans of Star Trek that it came to them. And what's fun in this story, it's about a group of TV actors who used to be on a science fiction program, and the program got canceled, so now they go around to conferences, and they feel stupid because they can't get work. Mm -hmm. But then real aliens land on Earth, and they've been watching the TV show in space, and they ask them to save the day because they think they're real. And since they really don't know what they're doing, they actually, there's another character who's a fan who knows their show by heart. They have to call that kid to save the day when they're on the alien spaceship. Yeah, it's marvelous. It's a marvelous time. I remember that movie. Yeah. Isn't it? It's a great movie. Yeah, so it's. Spaceballs is the same thing, but I remember that movie. Yes. Well, no. Yeah. Spaceballs is a parody, but I don't cry at Spaceballs. And it's not by fans. Yeah. No. I mean, it's my Bill Brooks, so. He's just ripping on the genre there. <laughs> but I think, yeah, that's just proves to us how, how far that particular fan fiction went, right? So to me, that's really powerful. And that's where it all started. Why is Bonanza up there, right? Because when I was a kid, how did I get involved in fan fiction? TV shows I loved with characters I loved. I wanted to marry little Joe. <laughs> so I wrote an episode where I got to be his little sister. It was so fun. And I wrote it in ninth grade, and I showed it to my English teacher, and she said it was really, really good. I used to write it in the back of class when I should have been doing class, right? All because I loved these characters. You can go online, and I thought to myself, well, nobody else in the world did that. It, there's Bonanza fan fiction. Online to this day. Blue my mind. I had no idea, right? So there's fan fiction for everything, all right? The other thing I fanficed as a kid was Lou Grant. 
which is a spinoff of the Mary Tyler Moore Show. He's a newspaper editor. I thought I'd grow up to be a journalist, a newspaper editor. <laughs> Turned out I didn't. I became a professor, but that's all right. Um, I couldn't imagine. This only ran for two seasons, but I'll be darned. There's Mary Tyler Moore fan fiction out there in the world. And there is some, and this is a Lou Grant, this is a crossover, Lou Grant meets Angel, which was the spinoff of Buffy. Who would have thought you could blend those characters? Yeah, really interesting to me when I started researching where can you go with fanfic. All right, then you come upon My Monkeys, which is what I'm doing a book about right now. This is a 60s teen show. Wait, I thought they were a rock band. They were a rock band, but they started out as a TV show for two seasons, and the music was so powerful, they became a full-on, they sold more in 1969, more albums than the Beatles and the Rolling Stones combined. That's how powerful they were. So I said to myself, well, I bet you, sure enough, there are miles of fan fiction, because everybody wanted to marry one of those four boys. And everyone's written those stories about how they got to know them and all that was fun. Now that's expanded to, there was an episode where Davy Jones, who was the love guy on the show, met Marsha Brady on the Brady Bunch. This is called Getting Davy Jones, because she got him to play at her prom, all right? This is, we're talking 1968, just about two years ago, Somebody wrote a fanfic called Getting Mickey Dolenz, the other dude on the show, right? She published it, you can self-publish these days, on Amazon. You could buy that for your Kindle for two bucks. And I was like, wow. And this was in, this was in 2000, 20, 2013, right? The show went off the air in 1968. So in 2013, someone was still writing stories, and now she can market that to the audience that exists in the world. And that's what you can do with fanfiction. Obviously, Doctor Who's just up there because that's my guy, right? Uh, and there's a million, you can see tons of Doctor Who fan fiction, so I waste your time. New show I've fallen in love with, you get all three seasons on Netflix. It's called The Almighty Johnsons. These guys are Norse gods in New Zealand in the modern world. Uh -huh. The funnest show on the planet, right? He's Odin, he's Ul, he's Hod. It's hilarious. They, and they have to complete a mission so they can all rise again to Asgard, all right? Guess what? I just literally finished binging that show last week. <laughs> There's fan fiction all about it. I'm like, I've got to start reading this now. I had no idea even the show existed. So as far as I'm concerned, that's what's really cool about fan fiction. You get to play with the characters you love. Now, you all need a camera because I'm not going to talk about this. So you want to take a flash picture or send me an email and I'll send you this. If you're going to write anything, every story in history follows a structure. And when I teach screenwriting in, uh, at Cal State Fullerton, these are the 11 steps of story structure. Any good story, the characters will follow this arc. This comes to us from Joseph Campbell. You've seen it in Star Wars. You can match it to any movie you really love. So you want to pay attention to that. As soon as everyone's take the click, I have one more, and then we're going to move on to Dr. Aaron, all right? Because we've got to do some writing. And again, I can email that to you as well. But that's the 11 steps of story structure. And here comes, if you're a more visual person, the Freytag Pyramid. Uh -huh. Gustav Freytag came up with this. He's a philosopher a couple hundred years ago. Exactly, from high school, all right? Same darn thing, but he's showing you how it works, all right? So if you're a visual thinker, it's all about telling me setting, Pixar does this in all their movies, so you can see it. Set it up, pay it off, right? And at the end of any story, somebody's got to learn something, the truth comes out, right? Did That's, this from Shakespeare? Um, he got it from all kinds of early novels back yeah. in the day. <laughs> yes? Um, it doesn't necessarily have to be one peak. No, there can, be, there, can be m there can be multiple peaks along the way, but his, this was his simplified just to keep that in your head. And then because we're going to talk about flash fiction, here's my favorite piece of flash fiction. Hemingway didn't even know he was doing it, yes. all right? He didn't know it was flash fiction, but it is. Look at how you can tell a story in six words that has emotion to it. Oh, yeah. uh -huh. Hello, hello, beginning, middle, and end, and oh my gosh, I'm about to cry. That's Hemingway, or so they say, it's, it's apocryphal. We don't know for sure if it was him. Some people claim it was. <laughs> Pardon me? I have no idea. Ah, if they were never used, what happened to the baby? Why they might be involved? Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. why are they selling them? <laughs> exactly. Exactly. So it's an example of how quickly, and apparently it was a bat in a bar. You could tell the story in how many words he said six. I don't know if that's true or not, but someone wrote that. <laughs> so as far as I'm concerned, that's what's cool about fl flash fiction and fan fiction in general. You get to visit with characters that other people took away from you. All right? That's what I want to say about the origins of it. Melissa's going to go into it much more deeply. I solemnly swear that I am up to no good. <laughs> All right. There we go. All right. Um, I've chosen to use um, some fan art. 
um, as illustrations for some of this because I'm very fond of that and I want to support fan productions. I've given them, uh, if you look at some of the handouts, you'll see so that that is attributed. Um, is fan fiction legal is one of the first things that people want to know. Um, are we going to get arrested? Um, Dr. Welch and I would not have you do something that would get you arrested. Um, the question really, I mean, it, people get to a high level of paranoia about it. The worst thing that could happen to you is a cease and desist order. But honestly, the Organization for Transformative Works has been going over this since at least since with Warner Brothers since the early 2000s. And there's just, you know, it's not a problem. It's a long, complicated thing. I'm not a specialist in this, um, but it's something to, to know about. You're not going to get arrested. Um, how far back does fan fiction really Go. Some people could say that it goes back as far as Samuel Richardson with the first published novel. Um, I always really liked it. This is the original Sidney Paget illustration, and then obviously you'll recognize BBC Sherlock. Um, some people call the Sherlock Holmes fan fandom the first big literary fandom. Uh, people were writing fanfic. Arthur Conan Doyle actually supported fanfic. Somebody sent him a fanfic, and he read it over, and he said, you know, it's really quite good. Um, and if you change all the names, um, I don't see why you shouldn't publish it. Which is so interesting because, of course, now we have all the thing about, no, this is the authors, you must not, right? Um, and that is not necessarily the way that um, people have always looked at it. Um, Sherlock, Sherlockians have a long tradition of what's called the great game, which is looking at the works in the Sherlock Holmes things as canon and as things that really happened and that Dr. Watson is carefully documenting something that really actually happened. And they'll have all these fabulous arguments about that. Um, and you, the, one of the things that's cool about the BBC Sher Sherlock is that it is created by two intense Sherlock Holmes fanboys who put in all kinds of goodies, little Easter eggs for those of you who are really, for me, including, who are um, really uh, big on this. Um, there's a lot of different definitions of what fanfic is. Some people go far into the end of everything that's derivative from everything ever is fanfic. And some people say, well, it's got to be something that's produced by a fan. Uh, but I wanted to go through a sort of a little fan fiction glossary. Um, fic, just short for fan fiction. Um, canon, the source material, and that is which is agreed to be fact without, with it, within it, always a source of debate. Um, it's, uh, it's different, it's easier to determine sometimes in literary fiction, um, where you've got, this is the published works in media fandom with large franchises, that can be a little more nebulous. There might be numerous spin-offs, there be comic books, or animated series, so I wanted to put it into a sentence. I don't care what anyone says, the comic books aren't canon, or... Midnight Sun totally made growing up Kel Colin canon. Or the, um, or, uh, the prequel trilogy for Star Wars. There you go. <laughs> right. Um, fanon, popular fandom ideas usually arising from a seminal fan work. Um, nicknames, character traits, or relationships, see shipping, may become canon. You never know, just as Dr. Welch points out. Uh, Dr. Um, James Tiberius Clerk um, is an, Kirk is an example. Yes? There's also a I know. I'm getting. I'll get it to it later. I want to make sure we've got. We've got. I want to make sure we've got time. But I know. I, I am a pony fan myself. So you know, it's on record. I, I like that. I like this stuff. Um, examples might be calling Hermione Myony. Never happens in the books. Um, character traits: Remus Lupin being gay, um, having a large record collection, being particularly fond of eating chocolate. He's never as shown as that. Um, crossover. We already talked a bit about crossover. You mentioned what was it? Bonanza. No, Lou Grant with. With Angel, yeah. Um, crossovers are anything where you've got characters or settings from two or no more works combined. X goes to Hogwarts is a classic. Um, anybody goes to Hogwarts. Um, AU, alternative universe, works based on a what-if scenario or one in which a critical change has been made. Um, say, left what happened if Voldemort had killed Harry, that would be alternative universe. Um, shipping, uh, genfic. Genfic is no shipping. It is romance, no romance in it at all. Nobody writes that. <laughs> I have, I have. But you know, the big thing is shipping. It's short for relation shipping. Romance fics featuring characters that might or might not be romantically involved in the source material. Canon ships are ships in which somebody is shipped in the actual thing. Canon ships are still ships. I have heard people say Ron and Hermione, that's not shipping. Yes, it is. It just happens to be canon. 
Uh, Fanon ships, um, they're not demonstrably romantically involved in the source material, but wildly popular among fans or a group of fans. In My Little Pony, that would be Lyra and Bon Bon, just as an example. Um, hang on a sec. Um, slash, same-sex romantic relationships. Usually they aren't canon. Um, or not provably so. Um, one thing that personally irritates me very much is people using the word slash to mean porn. Slash is not porn. Slash comes from, usually is considered to come from K slash S, Kirk slash Spock, meaning a romantic relationship between Kirk and Spock, therefore meaning romantic. Does not necessarily mean porn. Porn can be same sex, it can be opposite sex, it can be the Whomping Willow and the Giant Squid, <laughs> which is an example of a crack ship. <laughs> um, relationship is likely bizarre, um, ridiculous. Um, absolutely not. Uh, Mary Sue. Uh, lots of people toss around Mary Sue. That just means character I don't like. Um, original character I don't like. Um, the single most defining characteristic of a Mary Sue is to warp the canon universe and its characters to center around the new character. There is a fabulous webcomic I recommend very strongly called Mary Sue Must Die, um, in which she is somehow younger than Chekhov, and she is more experienced at flying than Kirk, and she's related to everybody. If their eyes change color with their moods, that's a really bad sign. Um, all the characters fall in love with her. She's related to all of them. She's ridiculously overpowered, frequently has a tragic past. Um, don't write those, but everybody always wants to. Um, and self-inserts are frequently fan uh, um, often um, Mary Sue's. Um, some people consider Bella Swan to be a canon <coughs> Mary Sue, because everyone is in love with Bella, and she looks very much like her creator, Stephanie Meyer, and yes. How do you avoid writing a Mary Sue? That's a whole topic. <laughs> There's great things about it online, I just, because we've only got 10 minutes, but I'd love to talk to you about that. How do you avoid writing a Sue? There's some great work on that, yes. Um, Fanfiction.net, um, affectionately or not so affectionately known as the Pit of Voles. Um, it is the biggest collection of fan fiction, um, so of its various different kinds of qualities. TV tropes. Um, make sure to have a friend call you to make sure that you're not still in there. Um, it is a fabulous collection, but still. Oh, fabulous. All right. Not still in what? What? Oh, it, it's a real time eater, right? Um, it, it's addictive. Um, what is fan fiction for? To engage with and celebrate love for the characters, as Dr. Welch mentioned. Um, to acquire and polish writing skills, sometimes publishing skills. Um, to explore a setting. You want to explore Hogwarts, you don't want to leave that behind. Um, the world of um, J.K. Rowling, of the Potterverse. Um, to answer questions. What happened to so-and-so after such-and-such a thing? Where was Lupin when the letter arrived? What happened? How come Neville is such a good dancer in the Goblet of Fire movie? Um, to interrogate or criticize the source material. Um, things that I don't like, I'm going to fix them um, to fix the source material. To reframe characters or relationships. Um, to place oneself within the context of the source material. That doesn't necessarily mean self-insert, and I'll get to that in a moment. And to interact with the community of fans. Especially now that we have the internet, to put up my fan fiction and to respond to it critically and to do various different things that are connected with that. I do write fan fiction, truth, and I also do reviews. Um, fan, one of the things fan fiction is for, to interrogate or criticize the source material, to fix the source material. Were you disappointed by a TV series, book, or film? If you still love your fandom, discover fan fiction today and leave the story your way. <laughs> Um, and here you can see a famous example of fixing things. Um, Harry and Hermione, many people felt they should have gotten together at the end of the book, and some people rewrote Deathly Hallows just to make sure that they did. Um, that was, yeah, they really felt very strongly about it. Some of come out of the fact that she didn't write like an encyclopedia or an outline so very late. She's going to write, uh, that's, compli that's complicated too. 
Well, I want to make sure something, one of the other things that fan fiction is for, it's representation, gender. You'll notice here's the Avengers. You probably know that when that, that first big shot of the collected Avengers was, was done, it was Scarlett Johansson that was pictured with her butt to the camera. And somebody said, you know, that was uh, irritated her. And they reshot the picture so that it was Robert Downey Jr., I think, who doesn't mind. You know, I mean, he's cool with that. But here are all of the Avengers assembled, and they're all female, right? Um, another example, fan fiction is for representation, sexuality. Now, of course, this is just friendly looking, but these are the science bros. Um, here is Tony Stark and Bruce Banner. Um, what's lovely about this is people have actually shown them pictures of fan art of the science bros or fiction. And Mark Ruffalo, who is a doll, just said, oh, that's so sweet. <laughs> is that what it is, right? Um, Harry Potter fan fiction. I think of this as the fandom that blew up the world because it came of age at the same time as the internet. All of a sudden, tons and tons of fan fiction. There's an easy way to publish it. There's an easy way to interact with other fans. Um, and I know a bunch of people who are still involved with it. Also, it starts up people who become professional writers and professional agents who are still writing fan fiction. The one I know best is Cecilia Tan. Um, who's been doing some very interesting stuff for a long time. Uh, the websites, a lot of the early, the early fights with Warner Brothers that happened settled out some of the problems with this. Um, fan fiction publishing and filing off the serial numbers. Um, filing off the serial numbers is what uh, some people call when you write a fan fiction and then you change the names and you change a few of the locations and then you publish it as original fiction. Um, Fifty Shades of Grey is a well-known Twilight fan fiction. This was what it initially was, Masters of the Universe, and uh, by Snow Queen's Ice Dragon. Really? Yes. What? Yes, yes, yes. Huh? this is true. I mean, I know the book that originally got a Twilight. film, but yeah. It is if you read it, which I have. Um, <laughs> it is, in fact, extremely close to Twilight. Very, very, very close. Where Oh, you just leave out all that interesting stuff and you just have him be a millionaire. Yeah, it's like, yeah, pretty much. Um, but anyway, I mean, it is, a, it is pretty much that is, that is what it is. And sometimes you can see traces of it where something isn't explained very well. Like what Jose is, what his relationship is to Bella. It's kind of nebulous. It's kind of confusing. But when you know that her, her roommate, Kate, is actually Rosalie, and when you know that Jose is actually Jacob, and when you know that the Cullens are all, they all line up, even the relationships, of those, the ways that in the, in the vampire kind of relationships, they all have these, these one true pairings, these little OTPs of their own, they all line up the way they do in Twilight. Um, except there's a helicopter in Fifty Shades of Grey. I have a friend who is reviewing it within, and he absolutely despises the book. And he's just like, that damn helicopter. I just can't stand it. Oh, he's sick of it. Um, but the thing that, now, this is not the only Twilight fan fiction that has been published. An example of it is The Office, which has now become, I think, Beautiful Bastard. Um, Gabriel's Inferno is another Twilight fan fiction. They're kind of proud of the fact that a lot of professional writers are coming out of their ranks. This is a big debate about whether it's ethical and whether it's legal. I'm assuming it's got to be legal or Random House would never have taken the gamble. But in terms of whether it's ethical, people argue over it quite a lot. Um, Oh yeah, yeah, it really is, yeah, you can, you can really see it for yourself. And there's all these fabulous things on it, and I don't want to take up time with it, but, you know, trust me, get me after, you know, buy me a ginger ale later, and I'll be happy to tell you about, you know, Fifty Shades. Um, and this is, of course, there we are. Um, I can't hear you. I'm reading fan fiction. The best way to begin to write fan fiction is to read quite a lot of it. Um, and Dr. Welch, you know, clearly, obviously reads lots of it. I read lots of it. Some of it's good. Much of it is terrible. Um, but you have to read some, even reading bad fan fiction tells you very much what to avoid and what not to do, like how not to create a self-insert. Yeah. I heard, there, I heard the Serians rule that says 90% of what you read is crap and 10% is worth it. Yeah. I can't remember the name of the rule for that, but it's Sturgeon's Law. Thank you. Sturgeon's Law. Um, but it's all about what you do with them. Right. And partly the way that we fall in love with characters 
has a lot to do with why they become, become interesting.